Thank you for inviting us. My name is Francois. Uh, I'm from Indie ID Quantique and uh, sales manager and working with LLS since uh, six years. Uh, I'm introducing here Martin Fell, who will assist us and also present uh, our slides today. We'll do a 15 minutes presentation about how uh, our technologies and quantum detectors are enhancing your research and um, helping us to move towards the quantum internet. So Martin uh, is our product manager, at PhD, and uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Francois, for that warm welcome. Um, and thank you for inviting us here today. We're very happy to be here to talk to you about photonic quantum sensing. Um, as Francois my, says, my name is Martin Fell, a product manager in the quantum sensing division of IDQ based out of Geneva. And our goal is really to enable innovation in this surging quantum technology industry through high performance single photon counting instrumentation. Um, in particular, I'll talk about how our Keystone product, the superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, are being used today to advance quantum computing and quantum internet applications to new heights. So, I'm sure you've heard of IDQ, but for those who haven't, we are in the quantum communication business. Uh, we're a company that was founded in 2001 as a spin-off from the University of Geneva, um, working on single photon detection systems um, and quantum safe communications. We're headquartered in Geneva with offices in South Korea and the USA, where the company employs more than 100 people with a still, string still strong focus on R&D and product development, um, employing still 50 engineers and scientists directly. Uh, the company is organized into two divisions, the quantum safe division addressing security applications based on QKD today, as well as the quantum sensing division, striving to build and enable the development of fundamental building blocks for the future quantum internet. So quantum technology is really set to revolutionize the world we live in. The progress in quantum computing is very tangible um, here and today, um, where quantum sensing and quantum communications will allow really unprecedented achievements. Um, the enhanced computational power um, you find with quantum computing for certain applications um, will be quite well exploited in a range of opportunities from finance, machine learning, pharmaceutical manufacturing and medical research, among other things. Um, this capability, while it giveth, it also taketh away. So we, it will give the power to actually crack our current cryptographic systems, which is where quantum communication comes in um, to help circumvent this, count, uh, to help uh, provide a countermeasure solution against this. So in terms of how we see the quantum internet. Um, this is kind of a, a broad schematic I have in front of you here where you have the, you have the end users work at remote locations for a long time. We can, it's very easy to imagine that quantum computers will be rather large systems um, at remote locations. Um, and here are the kind of building block technologies needed to um, actually implement, you know, a nice arbitrary distributed quantum computing in, uh, infrastructure. Um, you have your quantum relays, which will extend the link of your quantum channels and quantum memories to help buffer your quantum states as they're being transported across quantum repeaters to extend ranges even further, as well as trusted QKD nodes to distribute um, our quantum keys across um, a range of people. But important to say that this is more than sort of just a, a Q a quantum cryptography network. This is um, designed around full generalized sharing of quantum states for computing applications. Uh, in terms of what our vision around the quantum internet is, so um, here and now, today, IDQ makes high performance QKD and quantum detection apparatus. Um, for IDQ to work towards the quantum internet, either directly developing some of these components in the slide before, or enabling those who will, uh, we want to continue to turn our technology and expertise into off-the-shelf quantum communication components, um, including the detectors and integrated QKE systems, as well as making the sensing equipment that enables developers of complementary technologies. 
And the benefit here is that in the short term, security will be improved. Um, you'll see better confidentiality of data, which can be guaranteed in the long run, uh, sort of decades time. Whereas in the long term, we'll be laying the infrastructure for the foundations of the quantum internet where users will be able to exchange quantum states in a distributed quantum computing architecture, taking full advantage of the computational advantages that quantum computer has to offer in biology, pharmacology, medicine, machine learning, industrial manufacturing, financial modeling, and more. Um, so today we sell off-the-shelf QKD systems um, right now as well, and in the very near future, we're seeing improvements in quantum imaging, so seeing super resolution microscopy driven by lab research, um, for which we are an enabler through our detector technology. In two to five years, we see some maturing improvements in the quantum internet, uh, quantum communication infrastructure, such as quantum relays and repeaters, uh, which are currently very much driven by lab research, but later we are um, we foreseeing as enter the um, real world applications. Um, and what's needed here is sort of high quality quantum light sources, high quality quantum memories, integrated photonics where possible and, and robust high performance detectors. Um, at the same time, the free space QKD um, improved lower wavelength detectors around the three to 500 nanometer range will also be needed, uh, which we are pursuing. Um, looking a bit further into the future, five to 10 years and 10 years and beyond, um, standards and protocols for meshing quantum communication um, schemes together will formalize, be improved, the technology will mature, and we'll start to see routine meshing of quantum networks, sharing of quantum states, transducing um, qubits between flying, uh, flying qubits, quantum, uh, massive stationary qubits, and also qubits of different flavors. Um, but this goes beyond the motivation of QKD as the sole driver for quantum communication. Um, it's we're looking for general and routine distributed quantum computing, which really relies on the development of these uh, quantum transducers, in, which will be interconverting these flying and stationary qubits. Um, looking quickly at our product catalog. Um, you might have seen that we have single photon systems in research labs uh, where we've been detecting, uh, developing these models for the last 15 years. We have our, our semiconductor based devices, the SPADs or single photon avalanche diodes, which um, are fairly nice devices. They work in compact systems, um, which have sort of onboard cooling, getting it down to minus 40 degrees Celsius or so. And then we have the superconducting nanowires, which I will um, explore in a moment, the SNSPDs. At the same time, we have um, very nice, precise timing and control instruments. Our time control series devices, which do very precise start-stop measurements down to the picosecond precision level, um, as well as our very nicely pulsed lasers, where they're very, um, very stable, very short pulses in time, around 20 picoseconds or so, um, at a range of wavelengths. And we're selling all of these today, and they help our labs, they help our partners immensely. Um, great. Um, and with these products, you do for certain, um, you can work on these, uh, you can use these products for applications such as quantum physics, communication, computing, material science, um, also towards sort of less quantum applications uh, such as OTDR, LIDAR, um, and certain passive defense and surveillance methodologies. Um, so now to the, the meat of the presentation, where I think those of you may know that detecting single photons is rather hard, not because they are strange wonders of quantum mechanics, as you might think, but because there are simply far too many of them. Uh, you'd have a similar problem if you were trying to count the number of drops of water in the ocean um, it is a relatively simple matter to turn a single particle of light into a machine-readable signal, where photomultiplier tubes, PMTs, uh, and single photon avalanche diodes, um, these SPADs, which are sort of based around semiconductors, are examples of detectors that will rapidly turn a single photon into a large measurable number of electrons, much like the clicks of a Geiger-Muller tube detecting particles of ionizing radiation. 
Uh, the state of the single photon detection art, however, lies really with the superconducting nanowire detectors shown here. In these devices, we have a single meandering line of superconducting material, which is then held close to its superconducting threshold, where a single photon will create a localized but measurable spike in resistance. And this method provides very close to ideally high efficiency, incredibly precise timing, and very ultra low noise, to the point that noise uh, noise becomes uh, negligible in your experiments, typically. And this allows S and SPDs to provide a, a much wider range of sonic experiments than their SPAD and PMT counterparts. So, for example, uh, in this example here, so the very strong efficiency and noise performance of our detectors. So with these very strong performance detectors, um, they can go above 95%. Dark counts uh, depend on the wavelength of detection. But for visible wavelengths, you can see well, less than one dark count per second. Uh, in telecom C bands, so 15, 50 nanometers, useful for communications, you still see less than 100 dark counts per second. Uh, and this is limited by the, um, dark, uh, the black body photons which are being emitted. So they're very much thermal photons, which simply cannot be filtered out without going to zero Kelvin. Um, at the same time, operation is very broadband. You, the devices typically operate over several hundred nanometers, where, um, yeah, several hundred nanometers at very nearly peak efficiency and still very low dark count rates. They're rather impressive. And in one example of how this high efficiency and low noise help a real world application, um, we see the work at ICFO here on the right hand side um, by Samuel um, and D. Lago Rivera here as well, uh, where they were able to entangle um, flying qubits with stationary quantum memories, which is quite an important result for, um, for scaling up a quantum repeater for future quantum internet applications. And they wouldn't have been able to do this measurement in a in a uh, feasible time frame without this very high efficiency and very low noise this massive uh, yeah this massive dynamic range in their measurement capabilities allowed them to get the results in a, in a reasonable time frame at the same time it's not just enough to be able to see every photon um, you also need to be able to resolve them in time and as it turns out, SNSPDs are also fantastic here, where they have an incredibly high precision timing jitter routinely below several tens of picoseconds, which is defining the, your ability to resolve um, two nearly coincident events. This can be critical in photonic applications with features that are very short lived in time, such as photons with short fluorescence lifetimes or very short clearance times, T2, T2 star times. And thanks to this low timing jitter, in an example that Zhao Wei Ma and Jiang Chen with the Laboratory for Quantum Advanced Systems and Technology at the Stevens Institute of Technology in the US, were able to successfully demonstrate a high fidelity and low noise, ultra bright telecom wavelength single photon source. And for this, they used an arrangement of our ID281 SNSPDs with more than 85% efficiency uh, paired with an ID900 time controller. Um, and thanks to, you know, thanks to the dynamic range again of the detection, as well as the tight timing precision, they were able to extend the range of their um, pumping of the uh, microresonator device where they could see more single photons, i.e. deterministically arriving photons, um, which is very important for you know, future quantum communication and quantum computing applications again. If we, yeah. Harking back to the original slide of our quantum internet model, um, entanglement and single photon sources are, are critical there. However, we're also going a bit further here. So recently we've been working on um, a design to make our, our detectors even faster because the challenge here is that 
And if we look back at this slide here, you can see that when you get a detection event, your detector has some finite time where it needs to recover. Um, typically, kind of tens of nanoseconds for SNSPDs, which is already rather good compared to tens or hundreds of nanoseconds for a SPAD device. Um, we are now looking at this rather neat um, multi-pixel array where every single pixel, where every single channel of your detector um, uses actually several detect, uh, several pixels electrically connected in parallel. And the result here is that when one of your detectors goes dead, having um, collected a photon for a few tens of nanoseconds, the other pixels can still pick up the next photons coming in. You get an effective dead time uh, down to about 10 nanoseconds. Um, you can see here that, and what this does, essentially it uh, improves the maximum count rates that you can get from your single photon detectors, um, pushing towards quantum internet applications where you're dealing with gigahertz and single photon sources, uh, as well as sort of high key repetition rates um, in these quantum communication systems. Um, so in this plot here, we see the blue curve shows the um, results from a typical um, single photon detector, so a typical superconducting nanowire detector. Um, and you see it saturates, and this is a rather good device, it saturates at about 10 to 20 um, megahertz in terms of its maximum count rate. Whereas the, the parallel pixel design, uh, in this case with six parallel elements, um, sees, sees still well above 30% um, system efficiency, above 30% uh, above uh, 100 megahertz, and it doesn't even saturate until above 200 megahertz. So that's um, quite a useful result for anyone working with um, high rates of single photons or you know, very bright sources uh, where they're still looking at high power but single photon correlation. Um, yes. Um, at the same time, an interesting additional advantage to these detectors is that they are photo number resolving. So um, here we see an oscilloscope plot of various pulses um, arriving back from our um, nanowire detectors for different average photon numbers incidents. So you can see there's a 0, 1, 2, 3 or 4 incident photons each time and you get a different, prop you get a different uh, voltage amplitude depending on how many photons have arrived. Um, and you can use this to discriminate um, differently in your time correlating electronics to figure out how many single uh, how many photons in fact you have in a single um, within a single interval of time in your experiments. Rather useful for exchanging the range of repertoire of uh, yeah extending the range of repertoire of your quantum computing quantum communication schemes. Um, so as alluded to before, quantum computing is, is getting better, it's getting better fast. Uh, it's rather impressive. We're seeing um, real quantum advantages. Um, for example, the Zheng Pan results uh, with a boson sampling, which also relied on SNSPDs and Google's uh, landmark claim a few weeks, a few years ago now, it was 2018. Um, and as well at the same time to address its expanding uh, quantum computing um, in ecosystem that's arising. Um, we're naturally wanting to expand into photo number resolving detection. Um, and yeah, here is probably how we're looking to improve our devices in the future. So it's still getting better efficiency, better noise, um, but making them as well more complex. So enhanced photonic detection capabilities or photon number resolution. Um, and improving the form factor because this is a cryogenic cryostat. Uh, anyway, so that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about today. So, yes, I want to thank you again for having us. Um, Francois, is there, is there anything you'd like to add there? Or should we open the floor for questions? Thanks a lot, Martin. This was this was uh, transparent, quick, and, and it was was a nice summary to to to. to show how uh, with this next generation of uh, sensitivity with single photon detectors we can we can help every researcher to, to reach the next step in, in your research so we will we can be in contact uh, through uh, through um, our distributors in LLS so Sergey who might be here in the room 
and we're thanking you for inviting us. Uh, I hope next time I'll be able to come and present this, uh, this, uh, the, our new advancements and our new improvements there in Russia. It would be, would be nice. Right now it was not, it was not possible this time, but I hope next time I'll be able. Next time, possibly in, in next, next September, September. Okay, short questions from the audience. No? Okay. Okay, thanks a lot once again, Francois. Yeah. See you somewhere. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Constantine.